Welcome to the Voice of Salvation programming, whose main source is to be an inspiration to you through the message of hope and peace. And this is only achieved when you remain in tune. Stay with us and you will be blessed. Hello and welcome to the Voice of Salvation. My name is Nathan Bonilla, and I'm excited to have you with us on today's program. Today we will be speaking about having a good testimony. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, But in your hearts honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. A Christian may hold indifference towards various aspects of life. They may not have a preferred political party, lack interest in the stock market or national sports, and may not be actively involved in community affairs. However, one thing a Christian cannot evade is witnessing for Christ. As Jesus instructed his followers, ye shall be witnesses. Whether for good or bad, declaring one's faith in Jesus Christ is the beginning of bearing witness by word and deed. Peter's admonition to be ready to give an answer to every person inquiring about our hope in Christ is a vital aspect of being a witness. You see, some may think that being armed with proof and proof texts on various doctrinal points, is enough to effectively witness. However, this intellectual preparation is not sufficient. Many Christians do not know their beliefs well enough to answer even elementary questions from those seeking to know more about salvation. To be a truly qualified witness, one must go beyond intellectual preparation and ensure that their heart is filled with the Spirit of God through meditation on the Lord and His Word. This will cultivate an attitude of compassion for others and prepare the Spirit to share one's testimony with confidence and peace. A witness who is adequately prepared in mind, heart, and spirit can be fruitful in bearing the fruit of souls won for Christ. Matthew 5.14 tells us, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. The implication is clear. The world is in darkness. Philosophers may speak of enlightenment, and scientists may draw attention to their discoveries in the world of physics and technology. Yet despite all of its intellectual achievements, the world remains covered in gross darkness. Men do not know how to use their knowledge and get along with one another, or even know the source or solution to our plight. Jesus implies in this statement that only the Christian has the answer to the world's darkness. This is a strong assertion, but it is true. The true follower of Christ can dispel more darkness than the brilliant intellectual who may possess much knowledge, but is ignorant of the true light. According to John chapter 1, verse 9, the startling thing about these words is that Jesus was speaking to simple, unlearned people for the most part. You are the light of the world, was true of those who heard him that day, and is also true of all who are Christians in any age. The light of the world is the witness of the disciple of Christ. The same Lord who said, you are the light of the world, also said, I am the light of the world. These two statements must be taken together. The Christian is light because of his relation to the true light, apart from Christ. He is total darkness and has nothing with which to dispel the darkness around him. In this connection, remember the words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. The nature of a true Christian is the nature of Christ that dwells in him. This should be the dominant theme of our lives. We are lights shining for Christ in this world. Let it shine very brightly. 
A true Christian cannot hide what he is. His nature comes through in every place, in every phase of his activity. His responses to misfortune and disappointment, his conversation, his interests, and everything he does, what he is cannot be hidden. As we continue to read Matthew chapter 5, we notice in verse 15 that it says, Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. The purpose of a lamp is to give light. That is the only reason for it to exist. It is utterly ridiculous to light a lamp and then hide it under a basket. A basket here is to be understood as anything that would cover our light. Now, are you deliberately concealing your light? If so, you are living in contradiction. On the other hand, you are enlightened. And on the other, you are deliberately hiding the very function that justifies your existence. You see, a light that is hidden, or salt that has lost its saltiness, is, according to the Lord himself, no longer good for anything. Verse 16 tells us to let our light shine before others, so that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. People are watching us, and everything we do is being weighed by what we preach. We must let our light shine brightly and show by our good works and pure character that the gospel is all we claim it to be. If we engage in shady deals in business, hunt and fish out of season, spread rumors, or behave as unreliable employees, we will do great damage to the mission and message of Christ and His church. It is in these areas of conduct that the world is judging us. Our daily contact with society shows whether we are shining for Christ or reproaching His precious name. Just as a lamp must have oil to shine, a Christian must be filled with the Holy Spirit if their light is to dispel the gross darkness of the world that surrounds them. Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 through 16 says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Being on guard against a grudging and contentious spirit is crucial, as nothing mars the witness of the church more than internal quarrels and contention. The world hears a message of love and forbearance, but it sees a message of contention and quarreling. If we want to be effective in our community, we must be at peace with ourselves and, as far as possible, with all people. You see, the spirit of contention has killed the influence of many churches. Instead of feeding the enemy of our souls and playing into his hands, we should guard our conversation and make certain that we are not helping to present the world with an image of a quarrelsome group of people. Verse 15 says that we are to be blameless and pure shining brightly and beautifully in the midst of a crooked and perverse world. Some professing Christians have seemed more like smudge pots than shining lights, busy with fault-finding and contaminating others more than those they criticize. The damage they do to others and the cause of the church is deep and far-reaching. What the stumbling world needs is the clean, holy living of saints, who can mingle with the world and their daily activities without losing the brilliance and brightness of a shining light and testimony. Verse 16 tells us to hold fast to the word of life. And through the sanctifying power of Christ, we can be blameless in the present world. It is our sacred duty to reflect by our conduct and conversation that holy living is something to be practiced, not merely something to be preached about. By our lives we hold forth, for all to see that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. If our main desire is to please God, we do not need to worry about the opinions of others. It is far easier to please God than any man or woman. He is more tender, he is loving and gentle, and he understands for what our motives and our aspirations truly are. And if we aim to please him, he knows this and judges us accordingly. 
As we conclude our program today, we will read Titus chapter 2, verse 7 through 8. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Let's also add the book of Acts chapter 18, verses 9 through 10. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. We must model ourselves after Christ. Be a Christian and have a pattern of godly works in us. Titus 2 and 7 emphasizes that we need to show ourselves in all respects to be a model of good works. The outstanding impression we get from today's program is that the Christian life is to be lived among other people. Living apart from the normal world is contrary to the New Testament teaching on Christian living. It is in the normal course of human relationships that we are to show ourselves as patterns of good works, whether we are working for someone else, handling another's money, observing the laws of the land, or working with other people. It is in these human relations that we prove our discipleship, showing both by our works and our doctrine that we are uncorrupt, great, and sincere. Verse 8 of Titus 2 says that those who oppose us may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of us. Our speech must be such that it cannot rightly be condemned. Nothing speaks more forcefully than the Christian life than the observation that it causes men to be honest and true in all the little details of everyday life. Careless and dishonest men will be made to feel ashamed in the presence of Christian men who conduct their affairs above all reproach. Acts 18 verse 9 admonishes us to not be afraid to speak and not be silent. For some reason not quite clear, Paul was given this word from God as encouragement. It may be that for a time Paul faltered when he considered his task of witnessing and the possible consequences. But in verse 10, he is assured that the Lord is with him. This assurance should cause every Christian to trim his lamp, renew his oil supply, and go out with great joy as a shining witness for Christ. I pray that today's programming has been a blessing to your life as we looked at the importance of a Christian having a good testimony.